Uh, it's 27 April in Maastricht. We're speaking today with ambassadors to the Netherlands, Nabil Abusnaid from Palestine and Haim Divan uh, from Israel. They've just finished speaking at a Studium uh, Generale event, the Israeli-Palestinian Relationship Dialogue. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to Maastricht. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I spoke to you earlier uh, that uh, some of these questions were from uh, an, an earlier discussion that you had. Mr. Divan, you were speaking about 1948 uh, during that discussion, and you said something to the effect of, it's history, wow. Uh, you know, um, to the effect that people don't typically think that far back about these issues. And I'd like to begin with an historical question, uh, and one that's somewhat neutral. Um, the British uh, MP Jack Strauss, in, two, in a 2002 interview uh, with the New States Statesman, that the Balfour Declaration and the contradictory assurances which were being given to Palestinians in private and at the same time were being given to Israelis. Again, an history, interesting history for us, but not an entirely honorable one. Uh, and he actually went on to uh, talk about uh, British interference in a, a large number of Middle Eastern countries and uh, former colonial possessions. Um, he was uh, speaking in reference to the aftermath of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where the UK and France carved up what was left of the Ottoman Empire uh, with the consent of Russia. Um, do you ever have the impression uh, that Europeans sometimes forget their part in making a mess of the modern Middle East? And uh, Mr. Devon, would you like to respond first? Well, uh, we are engulfing uh, the present uh, conflicts, not only one. I don't know whether it will advantage us by, by trying to see who, who is to blame. And, uh, Yes, the uh, colonial powers uh, committed mistakes the way they committed in any other, in different other areas. Take, take Africa, for example. Take Asia. But uh, at one point, you have to move ahead, start afresh. And I think uh, the point that uh, at least we are thinking is relevant is when the UN, not the um, uh, colonial powers, but the UN took a decision for two state solutions in 1947. And, um, and I think that was uh, the beginning of a conflict which should be solved, but the beginning was over there. Mr. Abu Snaid? Well, I think the British at that time, I agree, they gave something to someone it's not theirs, and they promised two sides because they needed the two sides. And also, I would like uh, to say and to confirm the Jewish problem started in Europe, and uh, the Europeans really had to be blamed for what happened, and unfortunate, we Palestinians and Israelis, we have to live with the mess they make. In the same time, we have to deal with each other to find a better future for a problem we did not choose. I think the Palestinians did not choose this situation for themselves, neither the Israelis what, or the Jews when they went, what they went through in Europe. So I think both sides, we are the victims of history. And that's why I think we should learn how we can learn from what history and the suffering for both sides to have a better future for both sides and to blame one side or the other. It will not get us to anywhere. In fact, it will make it worse. So we should look for a better future, which is one future that we need to share one piece of land and there is no other choice. Uh, moving into the modern era, today we have the Quartet on the Middle East. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, not tonight, but uh, during the discussion uh, in Amsterdam recently. Um, some members of the Quartet, however, have um, a profound effect on the Middle East. The U.S., for example, has supported uh, authoritarian regimes and has attacked or is threatening to attack uh, various Middle Eastern countries. Um, do you think uh, that peace between Israel and Palestine is possible uh, given the, uh, what, what the quartet is actually doing in the Middle East? Uh, does that need to be solved before there can be a peace agreement? What has to be solved before peace agreement? Uh, the, the, the interference, for example, in members of the, of the quartet um, well, I, on the I, Middle East. Well, I don't think you can call it interference because I think uh, all sides accept the fact that the quartet is, 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 is a very, a very uh, strong uh, instrument uh, that, that could, 
could bring the two sides together. We uh, are not, uh, we wouldn't like them to impose, but if they can be as go-between and, and, and help us, bringing us to the table and, and, and giving us all the securities that both sides need, I, I think it could be helpful. I mean, uh, um, we, although with Egypt, for example, it was almost, yes, it was Carter that was, uh, you know, he was, he was uh, brokering the, uh, you know, the, the deal. With Oslo, it was without anyone, almost anyone uh, in, in the limelight. And uh, one, I don't think one can say that because there was no quartet, it failed. So it varies from, from case to case. But I think you need the international community there to give uh, both sides a little bit push, at the same time the confidence, the securities. And um, um, I, at least from our point of view, we, we, we are uh, accepting the guidelines of the quartet. But you've said uh, in the past that um, a lot of uh, Arab governments use uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine as leverage. Um, and if, the, if, for example, the, uh, the members of the quartet are, are starting wars uh, with the, the same Arab nations, doesn't that preclude a peace agreement? I don't think so, but... Uh... Well... Uh... To your question on um, Europe or uh, the Quartet or so, I think peace it should be done by the Palestinians and the Israelis, and I think they are the most people who think peace is needed. They have to do it on themselves, but they need a third party to facilitate this peace, and I think this is exactly what happened in Norway, in Oslo. It was the two parties because they have to decide the agreement, and they have to live with it. It is not the Europeans, it's not Obama, it's not anyone else. We and the Israelis, we have to live by our own agreements, and also we have to show that we have interest in reaching these agreements. So I think a third party could help. Peace cannot be imposed on the parties, because one side would say they didn't give us anything, and the other side will say they gave everything. So I think the two parties would be important if they are willing to reach peace, and this is what happened in Oslo. So we should not wait on the quartet, quartet because I think they are divided. They have their own interest. Also, the Americans, they have their own agenda. Each country, they have their own interest. At, but I think most important, it's what the Israelis and the Palestinians want. If they want peace, I think they should work on it, and they should get the support of the international community. But if they, one of them, or both, they don't want peace, I don't think uh, peace can be imposed on them. Um, well, um, moving on to the issue of refugees, uh, Mr. Abu Znayed, you mentioned the expulsion of Palestinians uh, this evening uh, after the, in 1948. Uh, this is often called the Nakba, which I believe means yes. disaster, a word that in many ways resembles the word Shoah, which means catastrophe or disaster. Uh, you cannot compare. Cannot compare. Well, I don't mean to compare the events, just the, the words. Um, um, uh, you mentioned making, reaching a fair solution to the refugee issue in accordance with the Oslo Accords. What is a fair solution to the Pal Palestinian refugee crisis? Should uh, Palestinian refugees be allowed to return to their former property within an Israeli state? Well, I think before we think how, what they want, or what should be the solution, I think the Israelis, they have to accept the issue has to be, to be addressed. Also, they have to be, to accept responsibility to what happened to the refugees. But I think the Israelis are not accepting the responsibility. I think I remember in uh, the secret uh, discussions with the Israelis, the f farthest we w got from them, they said we could be, they said, we could be sympathetic to the refugees, but not accepting responsibility. Also, we have to understand, we cannot change history. The damage has been done to both sides. All what we can do, we find a solution. We have to put the refugee issue on the table, like any other issue, and discuss it. What really the refugees' question need to be. I'm a Palestinian, and I'm willing to accept settlement to live in Hebron, not to go back to Palestine for the sake of my children, because uh, history cannot be changed again. So this is my personal view. 
But as a Palestinian, I think the issue of refugees has to be addressed. They should have the right of return or compensation, as stated in 194. But we are not looking for justice today, what to bring justice to the Jews who suffered or the, to the Palestinians who suffered. What we are trying to reach a compromise solution for both. But if we want to bring justice, we cannot bring to any nation, to any people who suffered. So we are uh, asking for this issue to be addressed on the table seriously. And the Israelis have to accept some of the responsibilities for the fate of the refugees. Um, Mr. Divon, Ambassador Divon, sorry. Uh, you said uh, that settlements uh, are one of the uh, issues that we recognize, uh, we being the Israelis. Uh, they're on the table and it must be solved. And this evening uh, you said that it's, uh, I believe, a myth that settlements uh, hinder a peace agreement. Um, uh, but according to BBC News, as of uh, 2009, uh, nearly 500,000 Jews uh, lived in more than 100 settlements built on occupied territory in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, uh, do you see how this might be construed as colonization of the West Bank? No. Um, if, if, you, if you look at the um, uh, 500,000, the overwhelming majority are either in Jerusalem and its surroundings, or cluster of settlements which are adjacent to the um, um, uh, uh, Green Line. And under every uh, uh, negotiations and agreements, if they would have signed with in, in previous rounds, it would have been, they would have been part of uh, Israel, and there would be swap of land uh, uh, in exchange. That was then accepted by, by the parties in principle, that, uh, that is in all the, uh, is being well documented. So the numbers that are left uh, is, is minimal. Uh, when when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu speaks about uh, painful decisions, I, I believe that he, he, he realizes, he realizes uh, that eventually some of them might have to be removed, but he says this is an issue that we are going to discuss. So based on previous, on previous uh, uh, rounds of negotiations, we, uh, uh, it's just, uh, we, we shown, I mean, it was obvious that it is solvable. The issues are solvable, and therefore, why losing so much time? It's there. Same with refugees, same with Jerusalem, same with security board, it's solvable. And the, the, the question is why we are not sitting down and trying to find the tough solutions. And there will be tough solutions for both sides to move ahead. Because this is the termination of the Israeli leadership today, of Palestinians. I mean, we hear that of Dr. Abu's date. But uh, as I mentioned, we think that the fact that uh, Abu Mazen procrastinate is for the reasons I mentioned before. But why, is, why establish a settlement in the first place if the eventual goal is a two-state solution? And um, it's going to have to be negotiated, th these land swaps, uh, to clear up the problem, why establish the settlements to begin with? Well, if you if you understand the the, the bonds of the Jewish people to to this piece of land, actually the cradle of Jewish life is not Tel Aviv, it is not uh, Ranana, uh, this it's not Natania, it's Judea and Samaria, the biblical names. So you one has to understand that people are not just decided. You know, I want to. And why do you have I want to, to be this place? If that's uh, no, well, because you can no, have both. No, if you no, think this no, is no, the place. No, it's not a question of having both. We were we were accepted much less than that in 1948. We accepted, and I'm it's and I'm going back to the basic point of departure. We accepted the small piece of land which was given to us by partisan resolution, and the leadership, Palestinian leadership, then with the rest of the Arab world, said no, and unfortunately it led to this uh, uh, very sad phenomena of refugees. Can I make a comment on the settlements? Yes. I agree with you. If the, we are going to negotiate your occupation, the departure of occupation, why you are building more? It's sending a wrong message to the Palestinians. I mean, what really your intentions are? Second, could you tell me one country in the world support your settlement policy? Even your friends in the Netherlands, your uh, friends, uh, Bush, Obama, any country, just Mr. Ambassador, name one country in the world agrees with your policy. Don't you understand 
the whole world is against that. Don't you understand the international law is against it? Don't you understand it's making it creating a problem? If you are going to leave the occupied territories, like you agree, why to do it? Just to show that if you think you have ties to this land, that means you have bad intention, you are not going to leave. So I think even if it's in principle, you said here and there, it's in principle, it is built on occupied territories, it's illegal, and it should not stay. So this is the position about the settlements. We are, if I may comment. Of course, yes. Um, the um, settlements today are not being expanded. They, the families which are expanding, you, you built within the borders of the existing settlements. The fact that we are ready to have this issue of settlements on the table means that we know that it has to have a solution. Solution may be that they would be living under or in Palestinian state. If there would be, let's say, Jews in the future who will be saying, you know what, I don't mind, I will live under a Palestinian state. There are more than a million Israeli Arabs that are living in Israel. Why, why it could be the same? And, and let's not forget that Jews were living there for generations, whether it was in Hebron, etc. They, in 1948, were expelled from, you know, from East Jerusalem, for Hebron, from Kalia, from, from other, other posts. So it is not that just one day, it ha so it happened that, that, that the Jews were there. So this is part, it's a complex issue, but, but for complex issue, you need to sit down and discuss it. And, uh, and we proved in the past that the settlements won't stand in the way of peace. We, we uh, proved it with the Egyptians when we left Sinai completely. We left Gaza. We, uh, we left South uh, Lebanon and see what we get in return. This is one of the questions that you have to see through the eyes of the average Israeli. Um. Mr. Abu Snaid, you said uh, earlier uh, at, in, in Amsterdam uh, at the previous um, event, uh, and this is a quote, uh, you know why I can't enjoy the benefit of a free world. What did I do? Uh, the Jewish problem started in Europe, and you said that earlier this evening, and we are the victims of the victims. Uh, what did we do as Palestinians? We have our people, I uh, know, what have our people done uh, to have this miserable life? What happened in the, history, uh, in the history of the Jews, it was against humanity. But what can we do about the past? We cannot bring back the people who died. You seem to be implying uh, that Israel's uh, policies are being driven by the memory of the Shoah, of, of the, the Holocaust, as more commonly called. Um, is that what you meant? I think the policy of Israel, two, thing, uh, two things. First of all, it came as a colonial uh, state on the expense of others. Even if you read the writing of many Israelis, when the first flow of Israelis or Jews came to Palestine, they enjoyed the hospitality of the Palestinian people. But really what worries me today, the Israelis still fear in the idea of the security, which in a way they are telling Europe when they talk, you don't know about the Israeli security. You better be quiet because the security of the Jews was violated in your area. So we are anachno, that we, the ones who understand the security, and then they go to power and occupation. I think this is a wrong thinking to have. Believe me, it's Israel will live in a better secure state without the occupation than occupation and demand in security. If Israel decides to leave the occupied territories, believe me, they will enjoy the security they need. But as long as they demand the security and continue the occupation, it will never happen. And depending on weapons, weapons could be deceiving. I think there is no better thing to depend on except peace with your neighbors. If you have peace with your neighbor, you can sleep all night without worrying. But when you really don't have peace with your neighbor, for some reason, that worries you. And I hope the Israelis will not live in the past. They look more to the future of me as a Palestinian, did not do anything for them, did not do anything for the Jews, did not do anything for the Jewish problem. What can the Palestinians do? Like, you know, if the Israelis, they could have the right to enjoy the, settle, the settlement search. Could you imagine a Palestinian cannot even go see where his 
place where he were really misplaced from, this is, I think we have to be fair. We have to ask ourselves, what is the best solution? And I think Rabin said it at the White House loan, enough is enough, let's divide this piece of land and live as equal neighbors. And I think, I'm so sorry to say, he was killed because really he wanted peace to the Israelis, not expansion, because he wanted to give up occupied territories, he paid his life for that. And many leaders did for peace. Um, um, specifically, though, about, about the, the question of, of, the, of the Shoah, uh, you've, you've mentioned uh, this evening that uh, security is primary to the Israeli state. Uh, um, we hear this often in the United States as well, where I'm from, uh, except it's usually national security. But um, uh, I'm wondering, uh, how much does the memory of the Shoah and of all of the, uh, the horrible things that Jews have suffered for over a thousand years, really, how much does this 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 sort of how much does this affect this notion of security? How much does it drive the the uh, the, the necessity for security? Of course, if you are uh, trying to explain how come, in spite of in spite of the fact that we are living in very difficult neighborhood, lack of natural resources, having to absorb so many new immigrants, refugees coming from, from all parts of the world and still maintaining a, a democracy, being strong, being creative. One of the strongest economies today in Europe, one, still one of the strongest economies. Where does it come from? It is coming from the fact that we are determined. When you feel that you are not going to go back to Europe the way your forefather went, mm -hmm. the way your parents' generation went, you are strong and security is one aspect. But we are not just sitting down and, and dealing with security. We developed the country. It is not that we became North Korea. We are open. Look at cultural life in Israel. Look at um, uh, science in Israel. Look at the academy in Israel. Look at the debate in Israel. Look how many, you know, the civil society, how many, how many uh, organizations that are yearning for peace and are, are criticizing the government. And what I'm always saying, if we would have had 1% of, of organizations yearning for peace on the other side, in the Arab world, we would have had peace a long time ago. So the notion is there, reminds us, but it's, it's not that we are in our shell, it is not that we are always uh, whining and, 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 and uh, um, um, thinking about what fate we had. We are determined, determined to build a country and also being sensitive to, to the plight of the Palestinians. And therefore, if in the past, one, sort of, one, one many, said, no, why, why two-state solution? There's already a Palestinian state in Jordan. Everyone today, except maybe you know, a fraction of a percent, say two-state solution. So this is already not an, not an issue. Now, how to get there? Because you cannot have another state without solving the core issues. You cannot have another state when you didn't decide yet where is Gaza, because unlike what Dr. Abu Zneid is saying, and, and, I, and I appreciate his, his words, but he knows he cannot speak out in Gaza in the same way because they are vowing we'll never recognize. They continue attacking on a daily basis, on a daily night. There is, there is a missile attack. Would you tolerate it? Would any other? And there are no settlements over there? Because, again, it's whether accepting, accepting a Jewish state. And for many, unfortunately, and here you can change it by educating it. Because, look, we know the Palestinians and they know us better than anyone else. We work together on so many fields. And here, of course, we're missing opportunities. It's a tragedy for both sides. Let us resume the negotiations, sit down and talk. We're all issues, all issues on the table. They shouldn't avoid right to return, abolishing it. We shouldn't avoid talking about settlements. None of us should be avoiding talking about Jerusalem. None of us should be talk uh, avoiding talking about uh, uh, secure borders. Uh, at, at what point is it secure enough? I mean, you, 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 uh, you have uh, people attacking your borders uh, from Gaza, uh, from, uh, you also mentioned from South Lebanon. Uh, probably there will always be some minority. Yes, there is a difference. There is a difference between an individual or a faction group that can be handled, and then ideology that comes from the top. The minute there is ideology coming from the top, take Hezbollah, which is a terrorist state by European uh, countries and others, United States, Canada, Australia. Take uh, take Hamas. If the ideology that is feeding the nation, we are not going to have. We are not going to reconcile. It's not a question of, of territory. We are not accepting a Jewish state in this part of the world. Then, then there's a problem. But th that, so, so with, with a small minority, we can always, look, we also have small, very fanatic 
groups, but we are handling them because they are small. It's not coming from the top. They are not being tolerated by, by the rest of the, uh, the government or community. And that's what has to be done on the other side as well. Um, it, it's actually uh, quite interesting because uh, if I listen to the two of you uh, downstairs speaking and also in the previous engagement, it, uh, it seems a bit more impossible. Uh, but when I talk to you here and you're sitting down and you actually, uh, uh, you say you're willing to negotiate on settlements, you say you're willing to negotiate on refugees, uh, it it does seem a little bit more uh, optimistic. One final question, and then we can uh, we can stop. Uh, uh, the original partition uh, plan um, uh, called for uh, Jerusalem to be uh, an international enclave under the protection of the UN. Uh, would either of your governments be willing to uh, be willing to negotiate on that? I mean, it, it, is it that uh, both of you must have the city, or a part of the city, or um, might it be an international protectorate? Perhaps you could answer well, first. Well, I think we are accepting the two states solution, which West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinian state. When you discuss the holy places, I think there should be a solution for everyone, any religion, to be entitled to worship where they wish. So there are places, uh, if they are important for the Christians, and a Christian can go, for the Muslims, they could go, or the, for the Jews, they could enjoy and worship where they wish. It is not proper, it's not right to stop anyone where he feels that he wants to worship it. If the Jews, even before 48, were not allowed, it's not right. That does not make it right today, because they were not doing that And before 48. Today, I cannot go to Jerusalem. Two, right, uh, two wrongs does not make it right. So we should have access to all religions, to all people. But believe me, sometimes I see the Israelis. It's not uh, because uh, security. They have to show a control of the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, they are uh, stopping uh, culturally closing institutions, anything to show any entity of Palestine in East Jerusalem, they are taking decision to close it down. They are taking decision to stop anyone from going to Jerusalem as, you know, think it's a security threat. Even myself and my children who are American citizens and were born in Jerusalem. I mean, what kind of law? would prevent them from going to Jerusalem. And tell me, is the Jewish law, is the human rights law, my sons today, I mean, even my son is a, a law graduate in the United States, always tell me, Dad, let's go visit Jerusalem. I said, Dad, I cannot do that. So what kind of law? See us suffering equally to the thinking you were saying, in 48, you cannot go to the Wailing Wall. Think of me now, I cannot go to East Jerusalem and to all places. So, that's why if I have to understand, and I did, you can, are not allowed, understand me and say enough is enough. He should go where he wishes. So that's why we should understand each other more and not to defend an occupation policy which really divides us more. Uh, Mr. Devon? Yeah. Um, the fact that uh, Jerusalem is one of the issues on the table means that it's an issue that we all recognize that we have to discuss and negotiate. So uh, uh, right now there is a certain situation and we have to, uh, to see how we are including Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be included in the uh, final status agreement. And Jerusalem is probably one of the most delicate uh, issues, but in the past already there were several formulas which I believe uh, it could be in the future accepted. And, and again, it's a question of building trust, of building confidence, of, of a process. I don't know whether you know, Jerusalem should be in the first, that's, that's relevant. But the fact that we say, yes, Jerusalem has to be discussed, I think it's, 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 a, it's very clear. But this is the only time, 6967, that three religions have free access to the holy sites. It, it didn't happen before. It didn't happen before. So all of them, all religions, enjoy and, 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 they, can, and they can visit and they can worship. This is a situation that didn't exist before, and, uh, and, and therefore uh, this is, uh, has to be recognized as well. So one thing in Jerusalem today is open to all religions, freedom of religion, but at the same time we recognize that it's an issue that has to be solved with the few other core issues of, of our conflict. Uh, gentlemen, I'm sorry, that's uh, all the time we have, but uh, thank I you. I make just one comment about Jerusalem. Um, Look to the Israeli policy and the practices against 
transforming Palestinians out, demolishing their houses in Jerusalem, destroying their institutions. And you tell me it's fair where the Israelis are entitled to build and take more land and for confiscation in land and bring more settlers, while the Palestinians deny their identity. How many Palestinians lose their ID cards daily? How many homes in Jeikh Jarrah, Silwan are demolished daily? What the Israeli practices in Jerusalem, I think it's go to international organizations and see. There's so you cannot deny really, the facts. Just, just, I'm sorry, but very quickly you can uh, because, respond. Because the Israeli really really practice that you get today, rights to build both on Jewish neighborhoods, Arab neighborhoods, and there's a very interesting phenomenon, which I'm not so sure you're aware of, Nabil, but more and more Palestinians are moving and living in Jewish neighborhoods, such as Givat Safatit, such as uh, Givat Ze'ev, uh, Neve Yaakov. Palestinians are moving there. So this is also an, an issue that you should ask yourself, wait a minute, there are some changes, interesting changes, and I think uh, this is a quite coexistence that is building bottom up. Well, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much uh, for speaking uh, with me and uh, coming to Master University and speaking to everyone today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you too. Cheers.